All right, let's get going. Grab a seat. Yeah. So good. So much life. So much life here. It's, uh, it's amazing to have all of you here again for those that are hanging with us, uh, wherever it is that you're watching. Uh, we're thankful for you. We're, uh, we, we know that you're there and we're, uh, we're truly grateful. I want to I want to start tonight with something, uh, look at these, these guys are just rolling, man. It's just a party up in here. That's great. Yes. Celebrating Aaron's baptism, I think, right? Hey, we got to get going, folks. We got to get going, all right? We can baptize her again if you want, but <laughs> I, I want to show you something tonight that is a moving. This is in the last five weeks right there. Five weeks ago, a college weekend. Of this past weekend, fall back. Okay. Uh, people right now are talking so negatively about this younger generation. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I, I see not just in this context, uh, but in young men that I'm hanging with, uh, our ML kids, all over, I see a younger generation that has a hunger for the Lord and nothing else, and it is stirring. It is stirring. Our vision here is to love God and love people, loving him and loving his. That through the love of others, we would embrace our call to make disciples. So I look at all of you now, maybe who some are battling with discipleship, and I say, look at the opportunity. The sheer volume that God has given us at this time, right now, the sheer volume of 24, 25 and under, seasoned believer, let's go. It is time to pour in and invest. I know the bench feels comfortable, but in the gospel, there is no bench riding. We're all in the game, my friends. So when we start to embrace the call to make disciples, when you open your eyes, what you're going to see is an absolute wave of a younger generation who long to be invested in. So I say, why not now? Why not us, church? Right. The question, though, the question, though, on the issue of discipleship, especially as we see so much of what's happened in Psalm 119, is what are we teaching the younger generation about enduring affliction? Now, what's happened in the past several weeks in the stanzas of Psalm 119, uh, we've seen a rise of the psalmist talking about affliction. I think one of the most critical things that this younger generation right now is being taught by disciple makers or the lack thereof is how to endure, walk through, journey along affliction. Unfortunately, right now in our land, I fear that this is the reality of that discipleship. Many of us teaching, even worse, showing by the evidence of our life that the Lord is just one of many things to help. In a lengthy list, he, he finds himself somewhere on there, but he's not, he's not the source, he's not the originator of help, he's not all that we need. Let me be super clear, in American Christianity, the Lord is just on some lengthy list of to-dos. Yeah, he fits in there a little bit, but he's just another anecdote. He's just another version of self-help. And, and when he loses convenience for you, then you can jump on to the next thing. Just to put this in a visualization, he, he winds up just in a list, almost hidden. Now, it's, it's not that some of these things aren't helpful, because they are. In, in fact, the Lord uses these things. We're just so prone to go to almost anywhere and anyone else instead of going and seeking the Lord who then sends us to some of these things as he uses them for his glory and by his power. I'm challenging us tonight to be awakened to lessons on affliction, to how tonight to walk through it, and way more importantly tonight, how to see him as our only thing. So let's, let's recap a little bit. 
Uh, every other letter that we teach or book of the Bible, we do a lot of recapping. We haven't done that much in Psalm 119. But tonight I want to show you this build as the psalmist has been showing us his affliction. Verse 50. Remember this from several weeks back. This is my comfort in my affliction, the psalmist says, that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. There, there have been a lot of stanzas in the early part of Psalm 119 filled with, with hope and, and almost like the psalmist's heart was impenetrable. But then starting here, he begins to be vulnerable about what's happening, what's going on. We see this in verse 61. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, that doesn't sound too exciting. He says, I do not forget your law. A little bit later in verse 69. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. And finally, John taught this last week in verse 78. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, the psalmist says, I will meditate on your precepts. That's the groundwork he's laid about his struggle. But I mostly want to beckon your attention to the statements that he made at the end of all those verses. Look at this discipleship. Look at this pattern of teaching. Oh, I am, I am amidst affliction. I am ensnared by the wicked. I'm being shamed with lies, but I do not turn away from your law. That doesn't change you. I do not forget your law. My affliction does not change your character. With my whole heart, I keep your precepts, not even half of a heart or a tenth of a heart. All of me, the psalmist says, and I will meditate on your precepts. What the psalmist is making clear is I need the Lord above all else. Parents, imagine... Instead of teaching and training your children to think that you got it, what if instead they knew full well that you don't got it? That you don't have it all figured out? Parents, the greatest discipleship that could ever be seen in your home is a desperate desire for the Lord to drive your life, not this idea that you got it all, that you can figure it out that you're gonna give them all the answers. Imagine growing up in a home where consistently, consistently, it's like kids, listen, listen. I am in desperate need of God's grace just like you. Let's call on his name. At the end of the day, I, I wanna love you and shepherd you, but you, you don't need me more than you need the Lord. Imagine homes like that, where dependency on Christ was taught and embodied, lived and experienced, friends. Imagine discipling relationships instead of pointing to our strength or our ability to navigate or our ability to teach or our ability to encourage. It was just consistently pointing to the power of Christ. The psalmist is saying, I am in affliction, but, but I do not forget his law. With my whole heart, I seek him. I need him above all else. Well, that brings us to tonight's stanza, eight verses. After tonight, we're at the halfway point of Psalm 119, my friends. Halfway home. This is week 11. So open your Bibles, turn on your phones, or grab a Psalm 119 journal and turn to verse 81. Halfway home tonight. But this stanza, these eight verses, my goodness. Check this out. Verse 81. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? Verse 83, vivid image. I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. Okay, let's, let's hang here a, a hot minute. Now, obviously, wineskins were uh, uh, certainly one of the common methods of, of containing wine. And what would happen over time is if they found their, uh, their way in a house or uh, above a fire, that wineskin would, would soon get dried up, uh, even shriveled. It, it would even crack at times or be so brittle that it would break. And so what the psalmist is saying is, I'm even, I'm even dried up. I'm in affliction 
But man, this is, this is really, really tough. He's saying this affliction is impacting me. It's affecting me. And still see the, what he says after the comma. Yet, in spite of becoming like a wineskin in the smoke, I have not forgotten your statutes. Verse 84, how long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments, verse 86, are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me, the psalmist says. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. And finally, verse 88, in your steadfast love, give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Halfway, 176 verses in total in the longest chapter of the Bible, and the question that's pertinent for us tonight is what is your greatest need? As we do often here, not interested in the Sunday school answer, the quick raise of a hand that you know, says, of course, Christ, I celebrate for those of you that, that that would be your genuine response, but I'm asking for you to gauge the evidence. Gauge the evidence of your life. In fact, just gauge today. Based on the last hours and minutes lived as you've walked around, been in class, worked, raised children, maybe had an argument or two with your spouse, I'm asking today, what was your greatest need? Now, was it a notoriety or a relationship of some kind, being loved? Was it the pursuit of your career? Scholastic success? Any of you guys, was that your need today? Scholastic success, right? Athletic achievement? What was your greatest need today? Well, what's going to happen in this stanza is so clearly we are going to see three very intensive ways that, that he, the psalmist, is going to disciple us on how to grow in need. So let's start here with these first two statements that he makes in verse 81 and 82. Come on. My soul longs for your salvation. My eyes long for your promise. So the, the word long, it's, it's a yearning. It's a craving. Uh, have you ever, uh, maybe some of you here who have uh, found yourself a pregnant, okay, and you've had a, one of those random cravings, right, like, bring me a McDonald's milkshake right now, stat, right? You've never had one in your life, but all of a sudden, there's this, there's this strange taste, this craving, I, you, you got to get it, you got to get it now kind of thing. Uh, some of you who, who ran track or a marathon, maybe, and your palate got parched uh, from the run, some of you have heard I... I attested the waters on a half marathon. It was literally the worst experience of my entire life, okay? I only ran about a, a half of it, and that was generous. My time was three hours and 10 minutes, so if you know anything about half marathons, that's not great, okay? <laughs> not great, terrible. Seriously, though, the, half, the halfway point, I literally thought, this is the end. I mean, I'm texting Heidi. I'm like, I'll see you in glory, because I'm done. It's over. The Lord's taking me home right now. I've never been so thirsty in my life. And you know they got those tables? Right? Well, I'm not running up to it. I'm just walking up to it. And you know, most runners, they take a cup. I li I'm like seven, right? And I'm just dumping it on my face. I mean, that, that's the yearning. That's the longing. Nothing is going to stop me. I, I have to have this. That's the image here. And so the first statement of three that I want to make is teaching us, discipling us on need. What we long for reveals our greatest need. So what you crave, what you desire, what you yearn for, that reveals by its evidence your greatest need. I, I wish, um, and I, maybe we'll do this at some juncture, I wish I could just teach the prodigal son every single night. Every Wednesday we come back, prodigal son, every, just come back, run it back, let's keep it going, right? And so I started thinking about longing, and the prodigal son was one of the first uh, stories that came up in the Rolodex of Scripture. I thought about the son that squandered his wealth, 
And there's this brilliant moment that happens as Jesus tells the parable, as the son realizes something. Look at verse 15. So he went and hired himself, the son, after he squandered everything, hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who then sent him into his fields to feed pigs. So he's, he's left all of his wealth now behind and scandalous living. And now he finds his way in the, in the pig trough. And again, this is a parable. So Jesus is marking this however he could possibly tell it. And look at this in verse 16. Unbelievable moment in the story. The son was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. Friends, this is so impactful because Jesus is describing the desperation that a sinner in his recognition or her recognition of sin begins to experience. Literally, as looking at the pigs eating in a trough, I don't know about you, that, generally speaking, doesn't stir my appetite. But he's so hungry, so famished, that he's watching the pigs eat, and he he wants it. He wants to be fed. And look at this. No one will give him anything. Imagine how disheartening. But that's precisely what happens. When your greatest need is to advance your career, you continue to to drop down the bucket in the well hoping that it's going to return something that will actually fulfill and the well comes up again dry. And then do you know what happens? The son, in that longing that doesn't get satisfied in the pig trough, he all of a sudden says, what if I go back? Maybe I can be hired as one of my dad's servants. And you know what happens, friends. The dad runs after him, embraces his son. This is precisely what Psalm 107 describes. He satisfies the longing soul. Christ, the Lord, satisfies the longing soul, the yearning soul, the hungry soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Not things from the trough. He's given you the keys to the kingdom. So if that's true, if the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, why are we searching for any other need if it can be fully satisfied in the person and work of Christ, I ask. And I ask you, but, but even more, I'm asking myself. Friends, he satisfies the longing soul. I've been praying this for a couple days now. God, just give us a longing for you and then show us how satisfying a hunger for you really is. Well, then what happens next? Maybe in your doodling, in your journal, uh, you've seen uh, these three questions. Have you ever prayed something that felt inappropriate after you prayed it? Come on. Have you ever said something to the Lord and you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. That... That was, but he already knew I was thinking it, and so anyway, it doesn't, it, right? It's, it's weird. Okay, there, there have been moments in prayer where all of a sudden, just in an honest conversation, something comes out, and I'm just like, oh no, that, that, I just said that. I, I just, I asked the Lord for that, or I questioned him in this way. Well, be encouraged. Look at what the psalmist says three times. I ask, when will you comfort me? Remember what we saw in verse 50? You're my comfort in affliction. He's already called God his comfort. And now he's saying with fists clenched, when will you comfort me? One of the biggest things I learned about prayer many, many years ago was to plead. And I had this image of the psalmist, again, likely in Psalm 119, David. If not, at least many of the psalms, David. I picture him crying out with fists clenched, beating the floor on his face, knees bent, begging God, a beg. When will you comfort me? Then in verse 84, how long must your servant endure? Does anyone resonate with that prayer tonight? Seriously, Lord, how long do I have to endure in this seemingly broken marriage? How long, God, do I have to endure with these disobedient children? How long, God, do I have to endure with this this negligent boss and on and on and on? Do you resonate with this? 
Well, listen, the beauty of honest conversation with the Lord is the chance to talk to him about it, to go to the source. And later in verse 84, when will you judge those who persecute me? And some of you are like, oh, I prayed that one. Oh, yeah. Those other two I struggle with, but that one, God, bring the judgment, right? Rain it down, Lord, please. When, when though? I want to be there. Can I buy a ticket, right? Just let me see it. Let me see it, Lord. I think we've been trained and taught to be cautious with the Lord instead of reverent and honest. The difference is caution holds back. We treat God as if he doesn't already know the innermost pieces of our heart. We don't want to speak out some things because we don't want him to hear, forgetting that he's omniscient and omnipotent. That's cautious. But reverent and honest, reverence is an awe of his kingship, and honest is like a son who understands the love that a dad has for him or the care that a father has for his daughter. Lord, how in the world did we get here? God, why is this happening? And unfortunately, in that honesty, some of us in our closet are waiting on the Lord to send some sort of small miniature airplane to, you know, write out the answer in the sky. Lord, please just send me a text message right now from an unknown number. I won't even tell nobody about it. Just, and we like magic eight ball the Lord. Right. Just give me a yes or no right now. Two knocks for a yes, Lord. Silence for a no. God, why is it silent every time, right? Why are they all no's? Right. <laughs> Instead of understanding that this is his voice. That his voice is speaking. Well, Mark, I've been asking God for years where I'm supposed to go to school. I've been begging him, God, tell me where to go to school. And then I open to Matthew 25, and it doesn't say Linwood or Mobap. Like, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Listen, we put so much emphasis on the nuances of God's will and hearing from God on these little things that we miss his overarching sovereign kingship over our life day to day. I'm king. Sometimes I, I really believe the Lord's like, just decide and glorify me in it. Sometimes I'm going to guide you right there, open doors, shut doors. Other times, son or daughter, just go and you're going to be the light of the world there just like you are here. Seriously, God could drop us in any neighborhood right now and it would be the same approach. Any neighborhood. It's just different neighbors. Same approach. Boom, here we are. We're a gospel presence in this neighborhood. Just like on a campus, just like on a team. It doesn't matter. Right. An honest conversation with the Lord, it opens up this thoroughfare to intimacy. Who we plead to, fists clenched, begging, reveals our greatest need. Wherever you plead, the evidence of that plea, where you're going with that, it shows, reveals your greatest need. I hope for some of you, the barriers of prayer that have been built out of your fear of not saying the right thing tonight could be broken down. And instead, the simplicity of a kid walking into the courts of the king and opening up our hands and saying, Lord, please, that you would all of a sudden experience new intimacy. Look what the psalmist says to this end in Psalm 142. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I what? Come on. I plead for mercy to the Lord. Really interesting, verse 2. I pour out my complaint. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. Friends, this is beautiful and rich stuff. But it's verse 86. It's verse 86 that has my heart. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Affliction, I'm enduring, the pain is great. And then the psalmist simply says, help me. Have you ever seen a moment in Scripture 
that is the full summation of your entire existence. It's amazing how two words encapsulates the full breadth of the believer's life. Help me. One of my favorite things, the image I just described now more specific, one of my favorite things about raising children is for at least a little while, there's the sense of neediness. I loved coming around the corner. Couldn't even, couldn't even say certain words. But just arms lifted up. And the face and the body language just said, Dad, I just want to be held right now. I just want to be held. Or, Dad, it's good to see you. I'm glad you're home. It's that simplicity that Jesus describes when he's telling the disciples, unless, unless you come like these, these little children, you have no part of me. There's a simplicity in the genuineness of faith, which is why where we seek rescue reveals our greatest need. Where you long for rescue, the source, what's going to pull you out, not just going to give you the lifeline, but going to redeem all of you. Whatever you seek in rescue, that reveals your greatest need. Psalm 71, come on somebody. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. No one else, nowhere else. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. And what's the word? Come on. Rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. It's the cry that God can't deny. The call for help. The seeking for rescue. So let's look at all three of these now together. When I asked the question earlier, maybe you needed some help to process. Now, some clarity. What we long for, who we plead to, where we seek rescue, these are things that help you gauge what your greatest need is. So I ask now again, what is it? Listen, there's certain moments in our life where some honest assessment has to occur so that we can be awakened to some of you the slumber that you've been living in. Maybe for some of you this is that moment. What is your greatest need? And now for me the thing I've been processing is, okay, I, I want, I, I know the, the answer, I, I want the Lord to be my, my greatest need, but how? How do I take a practical step in growing with the Lord being my only need? How, how do I get to the heart of the psalmist. And so I was considering that in the last several days and this image came to my mind. There's a distinct scene that I want us to ponder. As depicted uh, in so many films that we've watched, I see us uh, stumbling down a steep embankment we see the edge, the, the cliff we assume, and there's no way to stop. We're just rolling down this embankment, reaching, grabbing, trying to hold on to rocks to no avail. As we near the cliff's ledge, all of a sudden, a leap of our heart in a ray of hope, we, we catch the glimpse of a tree that's protruding from the ledge, the rock, the edge that we're getting ready to journey over. We, we see it. And so with, with one last gasp for life, we cling to the tree, holding on with all of our strength, feeling the, the flimsiness of the branch in the rock, hearing even the crackle as it holds our weight, hands holding on, body hanging, heart 
pounding. It's in this moment we realize our certain death. We realize the full gravity of our neediness. It's in that moment we realize unless someone comes and rescues us, it is all over. The dark pit below awaits. This, this, my friends, in a vivid image, please hear me, is the power of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hanging there, we begin to realize that he is our every need in the recognition of our neediness the understanding of life and death, hanging literally by a limb, hearing the crackle of the branch, he our every need and satisfies every longing of our soul. First, eternally, he is the only one who can save us from the debt owed for our sin, the only one. He is the only one who can save us from death, and he is the only one who can give us eternal life, only him. So as we consider our eternal neediness, what am I going to do about life and death? There's only one answer. There's only one. He's the only rescuer. He's the only one that purchased life. And in that recognition hanging there, oh, my friends, the beauty of belief in him now daily our daily need. Because we just don't have eternal need of him, we have daily need of him, amen? Daily he's our portion. Through the Holy Spirit, he's the one that gives us strength to endure. He's the one that gives us courage to be the light of the world. He's the one who empowers us to forgive those around us as we just celebrated in Eric's life. He is the only one who can daily give us joy and hope in the face of the dark here and now. Just him. No other place to go. Just him. And friends, what about future? What about the future rescue? The future worries and the future anxieties and the future questions that some of you wrestle with and the future what ifs. He rescues us, giving us his perspective giving us his vantage point through the Holy Spirit that says the here and now is not the end. And so we're just passing through then. Not citizens of this world, but our home awaits us in his presence, in the glories of heaven forever and ever. And so there we hang. And some of you precisely there tonight And in the full recognition of our eternal, daily, and future neediness of Jesus in all things, for all things, forevermore, you cry out, help me. One last ditch effort hoping that a rescuer is on the other side. And there the the mighty hand of redemption reaches down and saves your life, redeems you from the pit of hell and the reality of death and gives you hope and sets you on solid ground and builds an entirely new foundation on himself as the cornerstone with the simple, desperate, childlike cry, help me. Friends, that's what this world needs to see. That's what our children need to witness. That's what a lost and dark and dying world has to encounter when they encounter us is a people who have been rescued by one person. And we continually, day in and day out, cry out, help me, God. I don't need anyone else or anything else. I just need you. It's the same heart 
of the psalmist in Psalm 31. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. Let's stand together, come on. We deserve to, to fall. And unfortunately, I, I think some of you have pictured uh, the Lord reaching down to rescue you with contempt on his face. Burning hot with anger. Instead of a dad who longs to save and rescue. A dad whose eyes are filled with compassion and love and care. I don't know what it is for you tonight. Some of you, it'll be the cry of salvation. Help me, God. I'm tired of living for me. I'm looking everywhere for rescue and I'm not finding it anywhere else. God, save me tonight. The scripture says, anyone who calls in the name of the Lord, belief in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will, the scripture says, be saved. That's your promise tonight. Call on him, help me, Lord. The simplicity of a kid who needs help, call on him. Some of you, it's courage to endure. Some of you, it's how to walk through this pain. Some of you, there's something massively happening in the depths of your heart. All of us tonight, what would it look like just to call on him? Knees bent. Reverence and awe and honesty. God, here we are, help us. So God, I pray somehow, miraculously, that right now you would give us courage to call out your name. For so many of us, our greatest needs have been in things that continue to come up dry. God, forgive us for searching elsewhere. Hear all of these cries. Incline your ear to us. Come tonight, right now, in this moment, Lord, and save us and redeem us and rescue us, God.